All right, looks like we're recording. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for Sophie's thesis defense. It's always an exciting and momentous occasion. So I'm Scott Hamilton, one of her uh, advisors here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And so I'm just gonna go through a quick etiquette for the uh, presentation today. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Ileana Reese Cooley, who's uh, uh, Sophie's uh, advisor, main advisor on her pro thesis project. So we just wanna remind everyone to please uh, stay muted during the presentation. Please don't try to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. And then uh, afterwards, there'll be an opportunity for everyone to ask questions live uh, at the end, just like a normal defense. So once Sophie's done, uh, we'll open it up for questions and you can use Zoom's raise hand feature uh, to ask your question. And so that's under the reactions tab, which is either the top or the bottom of your screen, depending how your layout is. And click on the reactions tab and at, at the bottom of that should be a little uh, button you can click to raise your hand. So once you raise your hand, then we will uh, call on people and we'll ask you then please turn on your video uh, so Sophie can see you when you ask your question. Uh, once we're done with questions, then uh, we will then probably try to unmute everyone so you can all give Sophie a big congratulations. And then we'll ask everyone to leave so that her committee can meet with her uh, to finalize uh, the defense. And so I just wanna briefly say, uh, Sophie has been a great student. I've always been very impressed with her. I remember when she was uh, interested in, in Moss Landing and, and we were chatting, we had to set it up because she was in the Komodo Islands in Indonesia. She was diving and hanging out with manta rays. She had spent some other time in the Bahamas with doing research on sharks and teaching students. And I kept thinking and telling her, well, you might be kind of bored when you come to Moss Landing with all the exciting things you've been doing. But she always was, she wanted to come somewhere where she could learn a new system and learn some new techniques and skills. And you'll see that she's really done that in spades. Um, and Sophie as well, she's very driven. You know, she's finishing her thesis here in three years, which is quite an accomplishment. And uh, I've, I've just been always incredibly impressed with uh, how well she sort of comes up with a plan and sticks to that plan uh, and sees it through. And uh, yeah, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ileana uh, to introduce Sophie further. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. My name is Ileana Rizkuli. I am a research faculty at the Muslim Marine Lab, and I am a tenure track professor at the Center of Scientific Research and Education in Baja California. I have been the main advisor of Sophie, and I'm very happy to be here. I introduce Sophie and give you some insights about her life and how she developed her interest for marine sciences. Next, please. Well, Sophie grew up in Scarsdale. Here we have uh, New York. It's just uh, located 30 minutes north from uh, New York City. And you can see here a picture of her mom with baby Sophie. And since she was young, she has been an excellent, uh, very good athlete. Next one, please. She practiced gymnastics most of her childhood. And as you know, uh, this sport requires endurance, flexibility, and strength, a uh, lot of practice. And, and a lot more, and she was a champion adult. You can see Sophie here pre, uh, performing the vault and also the floor. Next one, please. And she was so successful that she was uh, in the news many times. She actually won a award for Olympic athlete. And later when she decided to slow down, next one, please. She decided to run. She became a runner, run cross country and track. And also, this is another uh, sport that requires a lot of uh, training and practice, and she loves uh, running. Next one, please. Her international trips and experience with wildlife is what transformed her life. First, when she was 13 years old, next one, please. She visited her family. Uh, she visited the Galapagos with her family, and she was uh, close to nature, connected with wildlife, and amazed about all the, uh, looking at all the species, the marine iguanas, and also uh, has very close encounters with the Galapagos sea lions. Eventually, uh, when she was in college, next one, please, she um, uh, spent a semester abroad in Australia, Queensland, Australia. And in that program, they spent very little time inside the classroom and a lot of time outside in the outdoors, uh, learning about the rainforest, about the coral reefs. And uh, she also have close encounters with uh, whale sharks. She came back to the United States and decided to take some classes about animal behavior. And then eventually she was in the Bahamas. Uh, so she was there a couple of times in different projects. First one, the Shed Aquarium Research and Expedition, and also the Bimini, Bimini Biological Field Station. She was working uh, with grad students, helping them with um, uh, shark research. 
And also eventually, next one please, she was at the Komodo National Park at the Marine Megafauna Foundation, working with another graduate student, working with manta ray and other fishy species. Next one please. She is the, the octopus whisperer. <laughs> She uh, has this strong connection with wildlife. She can have this connection with the most intelligent invertebrate species in the world. And I know that if she wants, she could write and film the second uh, chapter or part of the documentary, uh, My Octopus Teachers. She loves reading and writing. And she said, quote, I will read and write all day if I could. Next one, please. She's almost a marine mammal. She spent a lot of time in the water. She's an excellent, I mean, a very good open water school instructor with more than uh, 900 personal dives and she has gave, given about more than 300 certifications. And next one, please. She loves to dive to feel tranquil and free. And she said, quote, no matter how bad a day I am having, once I descend, I feel peaceful. And I know this is a feeling that I can share with her and also many of us. Next one, please. She lived science intensively when she was learning about uh, fish evolution, teleos evolution. She wanted to feel closer, closer connection and what does it means to be uh, a fish and how, how the fish evolved uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. Next one, please. She's an excellent hunter and you can see her here holding a barracuda. And um, you know that the barracuda are uh, very fast um, uh, carnivorous fish, but not fast enough for Sophie. And yes, she can, uh, she can work with anything. You can see her here also with working with top predators, with sharks. And as I said before, she has spent good time in the Bahamas and also in Australia working with this uh, top predator. Next one, please. She, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, she joined the Muslim Marine Lab in August 2018, leaving her family in the East Coast and friends. I know this was uh, hard for her. Uh, she missed them a lot. And, but also she has touched a lot of people here in the lab and in Santa Cruz. She has very good friends and spent a lot of time surfing, camping, and also writing her thesis and scientific paper. Next one, please. She has won many awards and honors and uh, she graduated with honors at Oaknet University and many more. Next one, please. And I uh, gave her, um, next one, the California, um, the California Sea Grant Graduate Student Traineeship in 2018. She was the, a, the, the top candidate. She brought a, a very good um, essay. And next one, please. And when I interview her, one of the statements that she made is that I want to make a positive change in this world. World, I saw that strong will in her, and I know that this is music for my ears. We want these students that want to change the world and make a difference. So I saw Sophie since the very beginning that she um, is a good thinker. She's a, actually a very good critical thinker, and I have seen that face that you see here on the. On the, on the left, she asked many questions. I, she used to come to my office with uh, 10 to 15 questions or I used to receive emails with that. And once I help her to answer some of those questions, she goes back with more questions. And I know she realized that as part of science, we, um, once we answer an hypothesis or test an hypothesis, there's two or three more hypotheses that open up. So I know that Sophie has a bright future and there's whatever path she decides to take. And today, next one, please, she will be talking to you about her work that we began a few years ago. Um, this is a complex study. It involves or encompass different species, understanding the feeding ecology of different species from different habitat and different trophic levels. And um, this is a work that uh, she was able uh, to break the puzzle and then put it back together. And she will be talking to you about uh, toxins uh, produced by harmful algae and the feeding strategy of different vectors. For me, it has been truly a pleasure working with her and I'm looking forward to see more of Sophie. Sophie, please unmute your microphone and please uh, you can begin your presentation. Thank you everyone. All right, thank you, Ileana, for that introduction. 
um, I'm quickly going to turn off my video so that my face isn't uh, taking up your whole screen and I will uh, will uh, turn them back on for questions at the very end. Okay, so first of all, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I am really excited to share my research results on how stable isotope analysis reveals differences in domoic acid accumulation and feeding strategies of key vectors in Central California. This uh, project definitely would not have been possible without my three committee members, Scott, Max, and Ileana, who have definitely seen me uh, struggle and cry a little bit throughout this process, but I'm so excited to be sharing uh, everything that I've done in the last couple of years with, with all of you today. First, I'd like to acknowledge the California Sea Grant who funded this really large collaborative, collaborative research initiative that my advisor, uh, Ileana spearheaded. And I was really fortunate to be able to be the graduate student working on this project with uh, Rafe Kudella, Clarissa Anderson, Robin Duncan, and John Field from um, uh, different uh, universities all around, the, uh, all around California. Uh, this is also a good time to acknowledge Matt, uh, Sharon, and Justin, who are uh, former grad students at Moss Landing. And these uh, students helped me uh, collect a bunch of my samples and also helped with the dissection process. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the ichthyology lab who helped, uh, helped me get through a lot of the preparation process with my proposals and my presentation today. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge all of the NOAA scientists and individuals from the Marine Mammal Stranding Network uh, who helped provide me with my samples and everyone at Moss Landing's Marine Ops um, and the faculty and staff for helping me today. Finally, I'd like to thank Jessica Kendall Barr, who is one of my best friends here and a fantastic science communicator and PhD student at Santa Cruz. Uh, and if it weren't for her, I probably wouldn't uh, be comfortable sharing this presentation with you all today. Uh, and also before I forget, I wanna put in a plug that uh, these co-authors up here um, and I have submitted uh, my uh, thesis chapter as a manuscript to Harmful Algae, uh, which is a journal that I love reading articles from uh, and hopefully it will be uh, accepted soon. Harmful algal blooms are considered to be extreme biological events that lead to a rapid proliferation of a single type of algae. A variety of different HABs exist, and many of them are capable of producing toxins. And these toxins, when they're ingested by humans, uh, are capable of causing pretty extreme illnesses, including paralytic shellfish poisoning, diuretic shellfish poisoning, and ciguatera, all of which are indicated here using the different shaped and colored symbols. Because these toxin-producing HABs are capable of uh, impacting humans, uh, it leads to uh, a range of fisheries closures and other management decisions that are often made in order to protect uh, human seafood consumers. When we compare the number uh, and frequency of these events from before 1972 until today, we see that there has been a rise in both the number and the type of HAB events within the coastal US. And this is not a trend that's just specific to the United States, but it's actually thought to hold true throughout um, the entire world. Amnesic shellfish poisoning, or ASP, is one of the illnesses that results from uh, particular types of HAB events and is specifically associated with the production of domoic acid, which is a neurotoxin that's produced in certain types of phytoplankton blooms that are from the Pseudonychia genus. In total, there are 52 species of Pseudonychia and about half of them are capable of producing toxins. This next map here uh, shows some of the more fine scale trends regarding amnesic shellfish poisoning, which is the illness associated with domoic acid events. And it's specifically showing the frequency of events that have occurred between 1990 and 2019. Um, and again, with an event being defined as a period where some sort of management decision such as the fisheries closures has taken place. And the size of the circle indicates the number of events during that given time frame. So what I want to highlight is that the primary hotspots for these DA events are along the California, Oregon, and Washington coastline. But in recent years, these have been extending towards the East Coast. 
To fully understand the research of these described trends and all of the uh, results I'm gonna show you for the next couple uh, slides, we need to take a step back and think about all of the threats that domoic acid poses. Domoic acid impacts human health, wildlife, and uh, the economy. With regards to human health, domoic acid is produced by phytoplankton at the very bottom of the food chain. And when these toxic cells are ingested by uh, organisms like clams and mussels, krill, juvenile fishes, and market squid, they can then be uh, exposed humans to uh, toxic cells itself, and this can result in amnesic shellfish poisoning. So because of the potential human health effects that these vectors have on humans, uh, fisheries are closely monitored and often uh, close as a result of DA events, which results in a lot of hardships for coastal communities. Uh, and this figure here is something that's pulled from a paper that describes the uh, causes and effects of the marine heat wave that occurred uh, in 2014 that resulted in some of the, uh, in actually the largest scale DA event in history. And what I wanna highlight are these vast closures that, uh, of fisheries closures, including those of mussels, razor clams, bivalves, and different types of crabs all along the west coast of the US. But we also see that wildlife is impacted, specifically California sea lions. These sea lions often strand in high numbers and are exposed to DA toxicosis from the same exact vectors that humans are as well. Currently, uh, operational forecasts are used to predict the likelihood of a DA event occurring in a given location. But these, and these forecasts basically pull water data that is collected from several different sites along the California coastline, and it gets integrated with time series and satellite information to create these operational forecasts. Uh, and this is what these operational forecasts look like um, with the color scale representing the probability of a pseudonychia bloom occurring given the uh, conditions that are currently uh, taking place in the ocean. But the forecasts are really only as robust and comprehensive as the data that's being fed into the models, which is what's essentially uh, leading me to the research that I'm presenting here today. And the key knowledge gaps relate to the location of domoic acid producing blooms and the pathways of DA transfer. So first, the exact location of domoic acid producing blooms and the precise location of where they're occurring is relatively unknown. But in order to have a better understanding of where the, uh, these events might occur, we need to first think about the conditions that promote domoic acid production. The phytoplankton community is definitely important as it needs to be dominated by pseudonychia, but this becomes complicated because not all pseudonychia blooms necessarily become toxic. And these phytoplankton communities are influenced by a range of oceanographic conditions, including temperature, nutrients, and the salinity levels. And all of these conditions are variable both spatially and temporally based on changing in upwelling and wind, the way the water column is stratified and even the uh, geographic features along the coastline. So this complexity is really what's driving the knowledge gap that we're addressing. It's difficult to know exactly where toxic bloom is going to take place because it depends on so many factors. And it thus then becomes difficult to identify what species will become a vector and capable of transferring domoic acid from the phytoplankton itself up to a higher trophic level consumer. The second knowledge gap that I addressed relates to the pathways of domoic acid transfer and the need to identify how toxins produced in pseudonychia blooms are moving throughout the rest of the food web. The starting, and this is, uh, this, these pathways can come in multiple forms. There's the pelagic pathway and the benthic pathway and both of these pathways involve different mechanisms. Uh, mechanisms of transfer can come through the tr uh, trophic transfer or the ingest ingestion of certain prey items and the physical movement of toxic cells. So all of these pathways, the starting point of these pathways all start with pseudonychia blooming and the bloom starting to produce toxins. And the pelagic pathway involves uh, different types of planktivorous fish and invertebrates, basically ingesting these toxic cells in the water column and accumulating in their digestive tract. And then once it's accumulated in their digestive tract, it can get transferred to higher uh, trophic level consumers such as sea lions. But the benthic pathway involves uh, the fecal or the poop pellets from these fish and invertebrates sinking to the sea floor 
or the direct sinking of single toxic cells to the seafloor. Uh, and this sinking process occurs really rapidly and will eventually expose bottom feeding invertebrates and crustaceans and flatfish to toxic cells either immediately upon sinking or later if it was buried in the sediment and then re-stirred up and introduced into the food web. So clearly these uh, food web dynamics are incredibly complex and uh, in order and the pathways can differ based on the habitat that we're looking at, which is what makes it challenging to know how and when a consumer across all of these different habitats is going to be exposed to demoic acid. Uh, in most commonly, uh, stomach content, urine, and fecal analysis are used to study the transfer of demoic acid. And these methods have been really successful in that they were able to link the stranding of sea lions to ingesting uh, anchovies and sardines that had toxic cells in their gut content um, from the pseudonychia blooms. And these methods ultimately led to the categorization of sea lions as a sentinel species for demoic acid events. But relying on these methods alone does leave scientists with a couple very important unanswered questions, including a, a complete picture of a consumer's diet as these methods don't provide information on the highly digested prey items. And it's also impossible to know exactly where the demoic acid was being sourced from because you can't identify where um, an organism was actually foraging with these methods. And this leads us to the uh, approach that I used in my study. I used a three-pronged approach that incorporated demoic acid measurements with stable isotope analysis of carbon and nitrogen. Carbon and nitrogen isotopes uh, essentially give us a broader picture of consumer diets and their habitat biogeochemistry and make up for some of the pitfalls that those previous methods um, have. Uh, it's also really exciting to note that this is the first study that's combining these methods. So isotope analysis essentially rests on the assumption that you can weigh the ratio of heavy to light isotope ratios within a given sample. And these values are expressed using the delta notation here. Oceanographers uh, normally use carbon and nitrogen isotopes to study biogeochemical cycling patterns in the ocean, but ecologists use them for slightly different purposes. Uh, we can use carbon isotopes to provide insight into the species composition of primary producers in a given region, and nitrogen isotopes can provide insight into the dominant nitrogen cycling process within a given region as well. And if you take these carbon and nitrogen isotope values from species at the very bottom of the food web, that essentially represents a community's baseline isotope value. And these baseline, these baseline isotope values vary quite significantly among marine habitats, which you can see most clearly here, which is a, a, an isospace picture from the Gulf of Alaska. And this range of colors essentially is representing the range of baseline nitrogen values um, within uh, the ocean. And these uh, baseline values end up getting integrated into consumers through their diet. And the way that these isotopes change or how they fractionate between a predator and its prey item occurs in a very predictable manner. And there's this preferential selection for the lighter isotope that's driving the fractionation, which essentially allows us to specifically use nitrogen as an indicator for trophic position. The range of carbon and nitrogen isotope values that you can measure from an animal get incorporated into what's recently being referred to as an organism's isotopic niche which is essentially representing the range of environmental resources that that species is using and can be used to answer really important questions on their ecological and their trophic niche. So I, the overall objective of my research was to identify the pathways of demoic acid transfer in Monterey-based food web. And I did this using stable isotope analysis and by asking three different sub-questions. And these include, one, which species in Monterey Bay are prone to demoic acid accumulation and how does this vary spatially? Two, do baseline isotope values vary spatially and what is the isotopic structure of the community? And three, what are the species specific foraging strategies that contribute to differences in demoic acid accumulation? Each of these questions is specifically addressing some of the knowledge gaps that I had identified in the introduction 
um, and can help us understand some of the spatial variation that occurs both in toxin accumulation and in baseline isotope values. So now moving on to the method section. Uh, the focus of my study was on the Monterey Bay, which is part of the much larger moving California current system. And it's essentially an ideal site to be studying the transfer of domoic acid because its phytoplankton community is dominated by Pseudonychia, which is the genus of phytoplankton that's capable of producing domoic acid. The Monterey Bay is also incredibly dynamic in its nature and it receives a variety of different nutrient sources, including recently upwelled water at Año Nuevo and Point Lobos, routine nutrient pulses into the center of the Monterey Bay, and even terrestrial runoff from the Santa Cruz Mountains and agricultural fields that come in through the Elkhorn Slough. I targeted samples that were collected from 2018, which is considered a quote unquote normal, uh, a year that was returning to normal after the major marine heat wave in 2014 to 2016. There were no region-wide HAB events during my period of study and no extensive fisheries closures. And I was specifically targeting, specifically targeting potential vectors, which I define as species capable of filter feeding on organisms that contain tomoic acid and contain toxic cells. And these potential vectors include krill, market squid, anchovies, juvenile rockfish, sardines, and mussels. And all of these potential vectors essentially represent primary and secondary consumers that occupy the center of the trophic pyramid. But I also targeted California sea lions because they're sentinel species for DA events and dungeness crabs because they're ferocious scavengers and also a very um, commercially valuable fishery on the west coast. When I refer to key taxa throughout the rest of this presentation, I am referring to these sea lions, crabs, and all the potential vectors. In addition to these key taxa, I analyzed uh, over 500 different specimens ranging from over 25 different species. Oops, just X'd out. Um, so my California sea lion samples uh, were provided to me by the Marine Mammal Stranding Network from individuals that had stranded within Monterey Bay between 2017 and 2019. Uh, and I was able to receive muscle and liver tissue. I also uh, collected Dungeness crabs with the help of Moss Landing Marine Labs Sheila B in July, 2019 um, from these two specific sites within Monterey Bay here. All of the potential vectors except for mussels were collected on rockfish recruitment and ecosystem assessment surveys, which are these trawl surveys that occur off of the California and US West Coast every year um, in the late spring into the summer. And I specifically got samples from uh, the sites indicated here, which is covering a wide range in depth and distance to shore gradients. I also got supplemental samples from the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey and sardines and anchovies from 2019 from the rockfish recruitment surveys. My DA, DA measurements were obtained to quantify the amounts of recently ingested toxins. And to do this, I analyzed tissues with relatively fast turnover rates, which meant the viscera or the gut content from all of the small pelagic fish um, and crustaceans. And for this meant the liver from sea lions, which isn't necessarily the ideal tissue to measure DA from, but it is providing us with information over the same time frame um, as the gut content. All these DA measurements were obtained at Dr. Rafe Kudela's lab at UC Santa Cruz using a liquid chromatography mass spectrometer. I measured carbon and nitrogen isotopes from muscle tissues that had been separated during the dissection process and they were then freeze dried or lithalized in these large vats. And once the material was all dried up, I basically ground it up, homogenized it and weighted out into these tiny tin capsules. And these tin capsules were then sent to UC Davis where they were analyzed on a mass spec. This mass spec basically measured the ratio of heavy to light isotope ratio within the samples that we gave them and compares them to an internationally accepted standard. These uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes are expressed using the delta notation on the left-hand side and are measured in parts per mil. So now that uh, I gave you an overview on how I got my raw DA and isotope values, I'm gonna walk us through the results 
for my first question. Recall that I asked which species in Monterey Bay are prone to tomato acid accumulation and how does this vary spatially? So to do this, I ran an analysis of variance using species from all of my key taxa as a factor and tomoic acid accumulation as a response variable. To look at spatial variation, I ran a linear regression analysis using longitude as a predictor variable, which essentially serves as a, a proxy for inshore offshore gradients and DA values from anchovies as a response variable. I chose anchovies for this regression analysis because they were representing all of the stations that I sampled at. So moving on to the results, uh, the analysis of variance did indicate that different species were accumulating different concentrations of demotic acid. And this histogram here helps explain these trends more specifically. So here we have uh, each of the different bars represents a different species and the amount of average DA that they accumulated. And what I want to highlight is that anchovies accumulated on average more than 10 times the amount of demoic acid than all of the other taxa, including mussels who are currently used as the coastline indicator species for DA events, and compared to other coastal pelagic foragers that were feeding in several similar habitats. And so uh, these results essentially suggest that anchovies, at least during my period of study, might have been the most powerful demoic acid vector in coastal pelagic regions. I'm going to highlight and talk a little bit more about the differences between uh, anchovies, sardines, and mussels later on, just because uh, they have important implications for detecting DA events across larger spatial scales. I'm also able to argue that anchovies were feeding on newly produced blooms at their feeding sites. And there were several lines of evidence that I basically used to support this conclusion, including that uh, demoic acid cells sink very rapidly. We know that they sink from uh, the bloom itself to the seafloor relatively quickly, but we also know that anchovies rapidly excrete DA as, through their poop um, that also sink to the seafloor very rapidly. So the fact that I detected such high concentrations of demoic acid in our anchovies is indicating that they were ingesting these toxic cells from blooms before those toxic cells had time to sink to the bottom of the sea. And all of this was occurring um, while mussels were failing to detect any sort of demoic acid event along the coastline. Uh, so the differences between anchovies and mussels uh, are pretty important or very important actually. So I'm going to talk about them in a bit more detail. So here the different colored, com uh, colored uh, columns in dark blue, we have our anchovies and in gray, we have our mussels. And these, what I wanna highlight is that the anchovies that were collected on May 15th and May 16th of 2018, within Monterey Bay were well above the federal regulatory limit that would cause the fisheries to close. But on the same exact day that these anchovies were accumulating such high levels of DA, mussels, the coastline indicator species, were not detecting uh, anything significant at all. So in sum, this basically leads me to believe that anchovies are suitable indicators of tomoic acid in offshore waters during periods where routine coastal monitoring initiatives by mussels are failing to detect these events. There's also some exciting spatial patterns that I identified. Uh, so here we have longitude on the x-axis with the lower values indicating more pelagic sites and uh, the coastal, the higher values indicating more coastal sites. And each of these different uh, points represents the average DA value accumulated in anchovies from a given location. And what I wanna highlight is that there is this positive and significant relationship and, and a large chunk of these anchovies were exceeding the 20 part per mil regulatory threshold limit. And when I specifically looked to see where those anchovies were exceeding the, uh, the regulatory threshold, I see that anchovies that were collected inside of Monterey Bay were accumulating significantly higher concentrations of demoic acid than those in other regions and outside the mouth of the bay. The higher concentrations of DA that was detected by anchovies um, and in regions inside Monterey Bay might be a result of circulation patterns that were essentially supporting bloom formation and potentially trapping demoic acid inside of Monterey. 
And I think that these circulation patterns are uh, most easily depicted on this map here, which is pulled from a paper from the 90s. Uh, and this uh, length and direction of these arrows represents the direction and speed of the surface currents. And what I want to bring your attention to is that inside of the bay, the water is moving in a cyclonic, very circular manner, whereas water outside of the bay is less circular and is moving more freely. And that these two potentially different water masses are being separated by water, what I think might be the water that outcrops here at Año Nuevo and then juts up at, down south across the mound of Monterey Bay towards Carmel and Point Lobos. And it's possible that some of this nutrient rich water that's being uh, separate, that's separating these water masses is uh, some of it might be getting trapped and contained inside of the bay and essentially providing fuel for blooms there. Whereas water outside of the bay might be getting flushed out at a pace uh, that's too fast to support any sort of bloom formation. So that wraps up my first question. And second, I'd like to ask, do baseline isotope values vary spatially? And what is the isotopic structure of the community? So for the first half of this, I ran a linear regression analysis using longitude as a predictor variable and carbon and nitrogen values from krill as a response variable. And I chose krill for this analysis because they're primary consumers and can be essentially used as a proxy for baseline nutrient sources. To look at the isotopic structure of the community, I took all of the species that I analyzed and I split them up into three different categories based on where they forage. So the deep benthic species might are, are those that feed off of the continental shelf in really deep waters, but on the seafloor. Coastal pelagic species feeding closer uh, to the shore within the water column. And then coastal benthic species are those that feed uh, closer to the coastline, but on the seafloor. And so I ran an analysis of variance using these foraging habitats as a factor and then the carbon and nitrogen values as a response. To look more specifically at the isotopic structure of the community, um, I fit polygons around all of these uh, different foraging habitats, which I'll show in a couple of slides. This here uh, represents my linear regression results. And again, we have longitude on the x-axis, um, and each of these specific points represents the average carbon values from a given station surrounded by its standard error. And again, we do see that there is this positive relationship between longitude and carbon values in krill. And more specifically, it's the krill that are being collected inside Monterey Bay that have higher carbon values than those collected outside of the bay. And if you remember, this is a really similar pattern to what I had identified in anchovies and their DA concentrations. And while we did find this significant relationship between longitude and carbon values in krill, there was no relationship between longitude and nitrogen values in krill. Uh, these spatial patterns have pretty important implications, which I think is most clear when we're looking at the two regressions side by side. So on the left-hand side, we have carbon values from krill, and on the right-hand side, we have demoic acid accumulation in anchovies. And I want to highlight that the same exact sites where krill had higher carbon values were also the same sites where anchovies had DA or were detecting DA concentrations that were well above the federal regulatory limit. For years, studies have been showing uh, that phytoplankton and specifically pseudonychia blooms are really sensitive to small scale changes in oceanographic conditions, which leads me to think that uh, the higher carbon values that were detected inside Monterey Bay in some way might be a characteristic of toxic blooms. So now we're, I'll move away from spatial variation and focus my uh, findings on community structure. And community structure generally refers to the way that species in an ecosystem are interacting with one another. And in the isotope world, uh, community structure is often depicted on these carbon and nitrogen biplots with carbon on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis. And each of these different uh, points represents the mean isotope values from a given species. And the different colors represent the ha uh, habitat they forage in. So deep benthic species are in gray, Coastal benthic species are in orange, and coastal pelagic species are in the pinky purple. Uh, and the polygons are then drawn around species, all of the species from a given habitat, which really helps us visualize the relationships that exist within the community. 
The analysis of variants did find that the nitrogen values from each species in each of the different habitats was distinct. And I specifically want to highlight the placement of octopus and spotted ratfish with regards to sea lion. And this again here is the same exact plot with carbon on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis. So what we see is that octopus and ratfish have higher nitrogen values than California sea lions. And normally this would mean that the octopus and ratfish are eating sea lions, as we know that the higher the nitrogen value, the higher the trophic position. But this is definitely not true. Octopus are not eating sea lions. In fact, it's most likely the opposite. But the placement of these points is most likely resulting from there being differences in baseline nitrogen values among these different habitats with deep benthic regions having much higher nitrogen values compared to more coastal zones. And because these nitrogen values between habitats are distinct, it's possible that we're able to identify the, the general foraging habitat of a mobile animal. And this is particularly applicable to hab management because it's essentially suggesting that the nitrogen values from California sea lions can be used to determine where the ones are that are stranding with domoic acid toxicosis or foraging and thus giving us some insight into where the actual blooms are taking place. Um, this again here is the same exact biplot with carbon on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis, but I want to bring our attention to the carbon values. So the post hoc test results did find that coastal benthic species have higher carbon values than coastal pelagic species, even though their polygons overlap quite significantly, and also is higher than the deep benthic species. And within this coastal, the pink or purple coastal pelagic polygon, there's this narrow range in nitrogen, uh, sorry, narrow range in carbon values at just above two parts per mil. But within this narrow range of carbon values, krill, who are coast, uh, coastal pelagic foragers, were displaying this significant inshore offshore gradient with higher, uh, with krill that had higher carbon values being the ones collected inside of the Monterey Bay, which is essentially suggesting that there might be differences in the carbon cycling um, between different regions inside the bay and outside of the bay. There are a lot of different forces that will contribute to the carbon value of an organism. Um, but the one I want to highlight here is uh, this species composition of primary producers. So carbon is fixed by autotrophs and depending on the photosynthetic pathway of that primary producer and its size in the cell's growth rate, there's going to be a different degree of isotopic fractionation between the carbon source and the phytoplankton itself. And this fractionation is then going to be reflected in the krill values that I detected here. So now moving on to the third and final question. What are the species specific foraging strategies that contribute to differences in domoic acid accumulation? First, I took the nitrogen values from all of our key taxa and I estimated their trophic position. And then I used their isotope values and ran them through these Bayesian isotopic niche models, which is essentially giving us uh, information on the species foraging strategy, which I then interpreted in the context of the species uh, domoic acid values. The trophic position estimates were calculating using this equation, um, and I'm not going to go through each of the variables, but I do want to highlight, and I keep saying this, that trophic position is tightly linked to uh, nitrogen isotope values. And this is because as a prey item gets eaten by its consumer, there is a predictable stepwise enrichment that occurs. And the consumer is going to have a nitrogen value that is anywhere between three and five parts per mil higher in nitrogen compared to its prey item. And meanwhile, there's hardly any stepwise enrichment um, with regards to carbon. And all of these values and steps in the food chain are going to reflect the baseline isotope value. So when we're looking at these biplots, and because of this stepwise enrichment, we can generally think of nitrogen values or higher nitrogen values as being an indicator of a higher trophic level, whereas carbon is more representative of inshore versus offshore gradients. So once I calculated the trophic position, I moved on to identifying the foraging strategy of all of the key taxa. And so I essentially took uh, all of the carbon and nitrogen isotope values from our key taxa and ran it through a model as input data. 
And I then fit these standard ellipses around the input data. And these ellipses essentially represent the isotopic niche or the theoretical range of uh, environmental resources that a specific species is going to be using given the isotope values that I measured in the lab and used as input data. I was also able to pull out the standard ellipse area, which provides me with a quantitative metric for how large that species isotopic niche is. I also quantified the overlap between each of the key taxa. So for example, here in the dark color, it might be one species and the lighter color ellipse might be a second species. And I took the percent of non-overlapping areas from these two species and I multiplied that by 100 and that gave me a percent proportion. And this percent proportion is essentially a reflection of uh, the similarity in niche size and shape between two species and is a direct reflection of their feeding strategy. Uh, before I go into these final results, um, I want to explain briefly how I uh, interpreted these ellipses. So when I refer to a small isotopic niche, I might mean something like this, where there's a narrow range in nitrogen values that's likely uh, indicating diet specialists who are feeding on prey items of a very specific trophic position. Meanwhile, this wide range in carbon might indicate that these diet specialists are feeding over a range of carbon sources. This is all in contrast to a species that might have a broader isotopic niche like this here in, in gray. And these broader ellipses have wider ranges in both carbon and nitrogen and are likely indicating that uh, there are more generalist tendencies for this species. But there's also a lot more individual variability and distance between these individual points for a generalist. And this might be resulting from their different individuals having different diets and also there being different baseline isotope values among their collection types. So to make these uh, results slightly more digestible, I'm gonna focus on introducing just a couple key species at a time. So remember here, we have carbon on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis. And each of these different points represents a different individual. And the different colors represent the different species that I'm going to be referring to. And so first I have mussels, which are the ellipse that we see at the very bottom. And I want to highlight that they have this really narrow range in nitrogen values, and they also occupy the lowest trophic position, which makes sense because they are at the very bottom of the food web. But this narrow nitrogen range is likely reflecting how specialized their diet is. Um, they're really limited to only eating phytoplankton that are small enough and detritus in the water column that's small enough to basically fit through its digestive tract. But I also know that mussels are inherently sessile and they are habitat specialists. They're not gonna move very far from their site of attachment, which leads me to believe that this wide range in carbon values uh, from the isotopic niche models is a reflection of them being collected at two different sites with very different carbon in, uh, inputs and potentially different primary producers. These, um, these findings are important because it's essentially confirming that the uh, that the signals that I'm detecting, both isotopically and in terms of their toxins, are site specific. So while mussels might be great sentinels for something occurring at a very local scale, they're not capable of detecting anything from that far outside of their attachment site. I also want to highlight sardines and anchovies. Um, so the dark blue ellipse represents my anchovies and the red represents the uh, sardines. And I'm directly comparing these two because they're normally lumped together as sister species. And I did find that they occupied similar trophic positions, um, which aligns with their pretty similar nitrogen values. And I also saw that they had these small and compressed ellipses with a narrow range in nitrogen value. And their ellipses also overlapped quite significantly by 40%. The quantitative metrics um, from my Bayesian models uh, also were significant, and it's depicted on this plot, which I'm going to walk us through so it's not too confusing. Um, so each of these different columns essentially represents a different species, and the y-axis represents um, the standard ellipse area or the size of that species ellipse. And remember that these Bayesian models are basically taking all of the carbon and nitrogen values that I obtained and is using it as input data and running it through several thousand times um, through this model. And the black dots are representing the mean 
ellipse area from those model iterations and is essentially representing the potential area in isotopic space that that species is occupying, surrounded by the 50%, 75 and 95% confidence intervals. So when we're specifically looking at anchovies and sardines, the sister species, I can confidently say that they have similarly sized ellipses and they're also very small, especially compared to something like the krill and the California sea lions who have a, a higher mean ellipse area and a lot of greater, a lot greater variation around that mean. So these results are essentially supporting my claim that sardines and anchovies are both diet specialists. And my data is specifically showing that this narrow range in nitrogen values and that their small and compressed ellipse areas in terms of their quantitative metric are all significant. And these two lines of evidence are all patterns that one might see in organisms that specialize on very specific prey items. But despite both sardines and anchovies being diet specialists, there were some really important differences that I identified between them. First, anchovies accumulated so much more demoic acid than sardines, and their ellipses were more different than they were similar. And these results are essentially indicating that these sardines and anchovies are partitioning or sharing resources and occupying slightly distinct niches, even though they're normally thought to be considered sister species. And this resource partitioning between sister species and the differences in their DA concentrations might be a result of morphological restrictions that are making toxic cells more available to anchovies and less available to sardines. Anchovies are size selective and they have coarser gill rakers, which allows them to feed on larger copepods and larger celled phytoplankton, which essentially means that they're going to be thriving in nutrient rich upwelled water, which is also where uh, Pseudonychia uh, blooms thrive. Meanwhile, sardines are non selective filter feeders and they have much finer gill rakers. And so they specialize on smaller copepods and smaller celled phytoplankton that exist in warmer waters that do not necessarily produce toxic, um, toxic phytoplankton blooms. So now to back up a little bit, we've talked about three species up until this point the anchovies in dark blue the sardines in red and the mussels in gray on this biplot with carbon on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis. And what I want to highlight is that the species with these specialized diets all have small and compressed ellipses. And it's this narrow range in nitrogen values that is resulting from each of them specializing on very specific prey items. And this is all in contrast to species that have larger ellipses and more generalist tendencies, such as the krill in light blue, the juvenile rockfish in orange, the market squid in purple, and the dungeness crabs in black. And all of these species have broader niches and greater ranges in nitrogen values that is reflecting that generalist tendency. And also none of these generalists were critical vectors during my time frame of study. And sea lions also have this relatively broad ellipse, which I'm going to discuss um, as my last result, just because sea lions are considered to be such important sentinel species. Um, I'm also just highlighting uh, the sea lions on this model output graph as well. Uh, and my trophic position estimates did confirm that sea lions were occupying the highest trophic position, um, but they also uh, showed that they had a significantly wider, or they had a wider range in nitrogen values than they did in carbon values, which is what resulted in this more vertically shaped ellipse. From the data that I was able to get, um, it's impossible to say exactly what the stranded sea lions were eating. Uh, but when I plot the sea lions here in um, the medium shaded blue in isotopic space with the anchovies in darker blue and the sardines in red, I see that sea lions were enriched and have higher nitrogen values between 3.7 and 4.16 parts per mil and were just barely enriched in carbon. And these values are aligning with the stepwise enrichment that we normally see between a predator and a prey item. So this is essentially confirming that these sea lions were consuming mid-trophic forage taxa, including anchovies or other prey items that did have similar isotope values to anchovies. But even though they might be eating anchovies who had really high DA values during our study, the sea lions were detecting minimal demoic acid 
which leads to my final argument that sea lions are not necessarily the perfect sentinel species at a local scale. And this is because sea lions are very mobile. The ones that are stranding in Monterey Bay may not necessarily be feeding here. And they also have a lot of variability in their diet and uh, different sea lions might be feeding on a very wide uh, range of prey items, essentially indicating that these sea lions are generalists. And th these generalist tendencies might be what's driving the individual variation between these points and the variation around the mean ellipse areas. So that concludes my results and discussion, but I want to take the uh, a bit of time to summarize my main findings and conclusions and tie them back to the original objectives of my study and the knowledge gaps I brought up at the start of the presentation. So first, I was able to meet my primary objective, and I was able to determine that the primary habitat sourcing domoic acid were coastal pelagic regions, and that anchovies were definitely the primary vector. And in terms of routes of transfer, these anchovies were directly accumulating toxins that were produced in new blooms before those toxic cells could sink to the sea floor. And while monitoring for DA events has definitely been improving over the last several years, um, these predictive forecasts are not perfect and scientists don't necessarily know how to pinpoint exactly where a DA event is going to occur. And these the current regimes are really lacking adequate spatial coverage. But because I was able to identify that uh, anchovies in this study were detecting such high levels of DA that were going undetected by mussels is essentially leading me to believe that anchovies should be used as another sentinel species and another indicator species uh, in all of the routine monitoring for DA events that is occurring. And as I mentioned before, anchovies were directly ingesting these toxic cells from the water column, but the mechanisms of transfer can also come in the form of mussels directly ingesting toxic cells from their site of attachment or California sea lions ingesting domoic acid from a third party. And by incorporating all three of these species into uh, with that have different foraging strategies into monitoring for domoic acid events, will achieve a much higher diversity in spatial coverage and essentially increase the likelihood of detecting an event. And lastly, the assessments on community structure highlight some of the important associations that lead me to believe that carbon and nitrogen isotopes should be used as additional tracers. I definitely think that scientists should be using carbon values to or look into how carbon values uh, is related to domoic acid production because of the strong association that I saw between where krill had high carbon values and where anchovies um, had DA values that were surpassing the federal regulatory limits. I also want to propose that monitoring efforts need to consider routinely incorporating nitrogen isotopes to identify the habitat sourcing domoic acid. And this is because baseline nitrogen values differ among species from different habitats, which makes it possible to determine where events are occurring by measuring the nitrogen values from consumers that have really high domoic acid values. So before I take any questions, I'd first like to thank uh, Ileana, who I somehow don't have any photos of us together, um, but for some reason, uh, she's always had a lot of confidence in me as a student and just generally uh, as a young adult. And I'm so glad and grateful that I had the opportunity to be one of her students. Uh, and everything I presented today is essentially a testament to what she's taught me. Um, and I know that all of the students at her new lab at CSSA in Mexico are really lucky to have her. Uh, I also wanna thank my siblings and my parents who have always encouraged me to go out and explore and spend time on the water, but also set these really high intellectual standards that I don't think I'm ever going to be able to reach, but I guess I'm trying. Um, I also want to thank those who became part of my pseudo family in Santa Cruz. Uh, I moved out here not knowing anyone in California, and I was really lucky to have moved into a house with, with girls that just happened to become my best friends here. Um, and then I also want to thank the Moss Landing community. Uh, the cohort uh, was awesome, and I developed really strong relationships with all the individuals in it. Um, and finally, I want to thank the Ward family. 
Um, I have been nannying them since I came out to Santa Cruz and have basically been adopted into their family um, and their kids. I love them like they're my own and they have supported me in literally every aspect of my life um, since I've been out here. Uh, so with that, I can take uh, any questions and I'll also turn on my camera. Thank you, Sophie. Excellent presentation. Nicely organized, clearly explained. And yes, we're going to be on the, we're going to take, uh, Sophie's going to take questions now. So um, you can raise your hand. And here we have um, Ruth Carr. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, hello. Um, Sophie, that was incredible. I feel like I learned so much about something I had no idea I was like. I mean, like you always hear about like pollution and climate change, you know, causing all these problems, but like with these algae blooms or phytoplankton blooms, like you just like really explained it so well. So I have a couple of questions if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, what are the symptoms of amnesic toxicity of DA or whatever that is? Yeah, so um, amnesic shellfish poisoning is, uh, well, so demoic acid is a neurotoxin. So it essentially affects the way that the neurotransmitters in your brain are taking place. So um, normally the symptoms are all neurological. So um, essentially you'll have, uh, in the like worst form, you'll essentially be having seizures. Um, and it's, can be very deathly. The, it was first identified um, in the 80s after a couple of people got sick um, up on, in like the northwestern area of Canada. Um, and since then, fisheries closures have been like really successful in preventing humans from getting sick. Um, but often these closures are like a lot more vast than they probably need to be, which impacts the economy. But um, yeah, so neurological simple symptoms is definitely the primary uh, effect on humans, but also sea lions. So in California, during these events, you'll often see sea lions that are stranding and like doing this like weird head nod. Um, it kind of maybe looks like they're scratching something, but it's like totally consistent and not doing anything for them um, or they'll be having seizures. Uh, and that's oh. like definitely uh, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network and the Marine Mammal Center uh, respond to these events. Mm -hmm. um, but the like questions on neurological aspects of this, like there's quite a lot of studies um, done by the vets over at the Marine Mammal Center um, mm -hmm. as like what exactly it does to your brain. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks, that answers my question. Um, and then I also wanted to know, you talked about the sea lions um, being, you know, having less of a, a DA, um, showing in their bodies yeah. as opposed to the sardines and the anchovies and the mussels. Mm -hmm. um, and you thought, you said that maybe because if they're a generalist eater or maybe because they, you know, go to a different place to eat, not just stay in the bay. Mm -hmm. um, but it, is, is there like, um, would the sea lion have some physiological natural mechanism that's allowing it, like it's taking in just as much DA, but it has the ability to metabolize it very yeah. successfully. That's definitely a possibility. And I think that the primary reason why I didn't detect any demoic acid in my sea lions was because I was sampling from individuals that had stranded over like a pretty over two year period. Mm -hmm. um, and that I was also measuring from their liver, which like inherently kind of filters things out. Mm -hmm. um, but there is like a whole other realm of research that I think like if I could go on to a PhD, I would totally want to look into the physiological aspects as to why sea lions are the ones that are being impacted by DA, because it's not just what they're eating. I mean, it definitely is what they're eating, but there mm -hmm. must be some other physiological factors that is impacting mm -hmm. it. Um, okay. This is, this is my last question. Okay. Um, uh, um, so it's like carbon and nitrogen. Like it seems like some, there's got to be some kind of balance between carbon and nitrogen and some of the species you looked at, like they have more nitrogen in them than they're supposed to, and some have more carbon than they're supposed to. But when the carbon nitrogen is out of balance in a species, do we have any way of trying, of being able to balance it? Like, let's say stirring the ocean more so more oxygen gets in it or so, removing plastic bags and pollution um, or... That's a good question. So the, there's not necessarily like a, I mean, actually there, I'm sure there is, but 
for the purpose of my study, there wasn't like an exact carbon and nitrogen isotope value that I was expecting to obtain from each of my different specimens. Mm -hmm. um, because basically like the, the signatures that I'm collecting are a testament to wh where they're feeding, what they're eating and how it essentially is uh, relating to the international standard that it's being compared to. Mm -hmm. So it's not that something is going to be unhealthy versus not unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for carbon and nitrogen. I don't know mm -hmm. if that answers your question or not. Yeah, it does. Like, um, okay. it's, and, 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 um, and it's a very good point that it, it's, it's not like specifically what you are looking for. Right. But like I mean, the perfect, what's, the, what's the perfect balance ratio? Well, there's like a whole other realm of research using isotopes. That's looking at changes in, um, like essentially climate change in like over the last several hundred thousand years using isotopes because, you can take isotope measurements from basically anything as long as it's been preserved. Um, mm -hmm. And you can use those isotopes to basically reconstruct what the carbon and nitrogen cycle has looked like over the last however many years. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want to read some scientific papers about that, I can send them to you. Um, okay. They're cool, but they're I'll also talk to you a lot after. to read. I'll okay. talk to you after. <laughs> thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so, so such good answers. Thank you. You're a good explainer. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for those questions, Ruth. Uh, also, uh, remember that you can open your video so Sophie can see you. And then we can take more questions. If somebody has questions, you can raise your hand. OK, Max. OK, I don't know if you can see me, Sophie. First of all, I'd like to say that it, it, this was a wonderful presentation. I had a really good time, and you did a wonderful job explaining those, those complex processes. And I must say as well that I'm really impressed with your progress here at Moss Landing as well. I, I remember when I met you first in my chemical oceanography class, and you really took you know, the stable isotope topic that we first discussed there to the next level. So I'm really impressed. So congrats on that. Um, I had a quick question about the the high delta 13 C values that you find in the Monterey Bay. And uh, uh -huh. I'm wondering if you could uh, comment on that a bit and maybe explain, you know, why do you think uh, you found higher delta 13 C value is within the bay uh, compared to outside? Yeah. Um, so I definitely thought that this was going to be a question I was going to get from you. Um, and it definitely uh, ties back to some of what, you know, am I still sharing my screen? Um, okay, so let me go back to the slide on looking at the Monterey Bay, um, because I think it ties specifically back to um, some of the circulation patterns and basically like what is happening within Monterey Bay. Um, actually, it's going to take me a while. It's okay. We don't need the slide. Um, so the carbon values that you're detecting from krill reflects a lot of different processes, including photosynthesis. And I think that one of the primary, not mistakes that I made in the last draft of my paper that you read, but I don't think it's nearly as related to upwelling as um, I was writing it out to be. I think it has more has to do with the differences in the, um, the types of phytoplankton that you have inside the bay versus outside of the bay. Um, so there's a lot of studies uh, done from like lab work, but also um, in the field that look at how different species of phytoplankton fix carbon and ha what happens as they're fixing carbon and how that uh, the carbon is fractionating. Um, and so because uh, there is this fractionation that occurs during photosynthesis, the the organic matter is going to get depleted in nitrogen or sorry in carbon 13 um, which what is what might lead to a more negative value in certain areas of the bay um, but there's I mean there's so many conflicting findings that I've been reading in different papers but I think it has to do mostly with the phytoplankton community composition and diatoms and pseudonychia which are generally dominating inside of the bay, having um, generally higher carbon values than smaller phytoplankton that are influenced um, by like the larger California current system outside of the mouth. Thank you, Max. Is there any other question? Oh, wait, I don't think. 
uh, GGS or sorry, GJS iPhone has a question. Yeah, it's Jason. Hi. Oh, hey. <laughs> hi, hi. How's hi. it going? And I saw a burn the background of one of the people out here. <laughs> uh, anyways, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, on the chart you were just showing, uh, okay. where where would you think uh, Sudanitskia would uh, sit in terms of their uh, carbon to nitrogen isotopic um, ratios? Yeah, okay. I would say they, well, so if I had to design a whole new study for a PhD or another master's student, I would definitely be looking at the carb or like <laughs> analyzing carbon and nitrogen from the um, phytoplankton at all of our stations, but they're definitely gonna have a lower nitrogen value and a, um, I would imagine they also have a lower carbon value compared to, or actually I guess they would have a higher carbon value compared yeah, to the, the zooplankton um, or the krill, which are the zooplankton here. So they would have a higher carbon value, but a lower nitrogen value because they're more at the bottom of the food web. Mm -hmm. And so what, what do you, uh sort of puzzled by you know you see that nice uh, carbon regression in mm -hmm. bay versus out bay for the krill uh but not the antro i mean the anchovies and sardines and uh pink is who squid all mm -hmm. that's their clusters seem to be very flat yeah, so the krill did have that significant relationship between inshore versus offshore, and I think that that's something that definitely needs to be explored more. Um, there were not any significant relationships that I found with um, the uh, inshore versus offshore for the other taxa, um, and I don't know if that's necessarily because of just the individuals that I collected. I mean, everything here was very opportunistic, so the samples were basically given to us by um, uh, research cruises that were already going out. So it was not nearly as comprehensive as what we would need to explicitly say what is happening um, with the carbon values um, and the nitrogen values. But I mean, I think it's interesting that there is a relationship that we identified in krill with carbon, but not in nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, this was something that I've talked to Ileana about. Um, and I, I think that that it might be a result of our sampling, but I also think that we would have different findings if we were using um, compound specific isotope analysis um, and using different source tracers um, or different source amino acid tracers to basically basically get like a, a, a more detailed look at the potential differences in nitrogen sources at the different locations. Um, but I think it's hard to take away anything like concrete from this study without having looked at um, the like general oceanographic variables at the given um, sampling sites and without looking at the uh, phytoplankton and the species composition of them at the sites where all of our other organisms were collected. Yeah, good. Uh, and that leaves me with that, that uh, cool cluster that's way out at the side, the Dungeness crab, which as you yeah. know, we're totally hammered in the uh, 2015 Demoic. Mm -hmm. I mean, several months later, they were discovered to be super toxic, toxic. and closed down for years. But mm -hmm. this chart would suggest they're feeding on something very different. Well, I mean, they definitely, I think that the, the nitrogen values that we see for Dungeness crabs is more of a reflection of um, the fact that benthic habitats are enriched in nitrogen. Um, so the predictable like three part per mil stepwise enrichment might not necessarily apply to dungeons. I mean, it definitely applies to dungeons crabs, but mm -hmm. it might not be reflected using these bulk isotopes because you're kind of comparing apples to oranges. Um, so I think to mo look more at the diet of Dungeness crabs, we definitely, there's like surprisingly not a whole lot about, um, or like not much on uh, using stomach content analysis, but I think if we looked at using amino acids, what they were eating and how the different, uh, like what the different dominant nitrogen cycling processes are between the benthos and the water column, we'd essentially be able to like fit, maybe fix for that, um, 
uh, inadequate comparison. That's, I'm not doing a very good job of answering your question. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think that the, it's all going back to the fact that dungeness crabs, yes, they feed on a lot of different organisms in the benthos mm -hmm. and they're stirring up sediment and getting DA potentially years after the actual event. Um, but the nitrogen values is tying back to more of the fact that there's like a totally different nitrogen cycling process that occurs in the bottom sediment compared to what's in the water column. Mm -hmm. And this would, I mean, your, your data set would suggest they're feeding on a different sea source as well, perhaps. Uh, uh, help, yeah, probably. Or, uh, yeah. Some other macro al algae to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. The cleanest, cleanest data sets on these isotopes that I've, I've seen. It's, very, you know, nice, nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but Thank you, very Jason. complex question. I know. Yeah, I, we can one, talk more one about final it. one because I know Ileana and company and you probably have been pursuing it for years. But did you ever get a isotopic ratio on demoic acid itself? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no, we 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 try. We when we try with a uh, we purchase a synthetic VA and yeah, we were not, we have not been successful yet. Yeah. That was the initial idea. I just wanted to add uh, to your question uh, that uh, we just have collection in two sites for the Dungeness crab. Mm -hmm. So we could have, uh, I think in another study, we can have different uh, sampling sites and you can we can probably explore more this variability um, in different areas for the isotope part and also for the VA. So this was just pretty much in front of most landing. Yeah, no, that would be really cool because they, they seem potentially like the Dungeness could uh, move around quite a bit in that CN space. Yeah, yeah and, they definitely can. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks for, for the questions. questions. So, okay, um, we have been, I mean, is there, does anybody has a question, any other question? Um, Sam, I'll let you ask a question, but you're so intelligent that I'm worried I won't be able to answer it, but um, <laughs> you can ask me one. Uh, hey, thanks. Yeah, um, this was a really great talk. I was wondering, early, pretty early on in your results, you showed some plots of um, DA versus longitude. Uh-huh. Yeah, hold on. Um, we can try to find one of those. Yeah. Oh, so no, was, that one. Wait, if you just go back a couple, there was one that I thought. That was carbon. Um, you want oh. the DA? Yeah. If you, there was one. Yeah. Right here. here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking at the points on both of these. One is carbon and one is DA labeled 113. Your mouse is yeah. right on it because I think yeah. you know what my question is, which uh -huh. is what is happening at station 113? Um, my um, Max, my committee member also asked me that. And I think that it has, so station 113 is right here. And I, if I had to make my most educated guess, I think it has to do with the fact that the upwelled water is, which is um, uh, the nutrient rich water is coming up here and being shot across the shelf to Point Lobos and Carmel in like the Pacific Grove area. And I think that this might be like the, kind of an outlier between what is getting circulated throughout like the larger California current system out here versus what's getting trapped inside of Monterey Bay. So basically it's like closer to the bay, but it acts as if it's out in the ocean. Because I mean, it yeah, it's like, it definitely kind of looks like it's in the bay, but if you, um, I guess this is the slide I want to show you. Oh yeah, here. So station 113 is like right here. And so you can see that this, it's like part of that water mass that might be separating what's getting trapped inside of the bay and the stations that have really high DA values versus what's getting um, like moved around and like what's, what's being influenced by the larger system um, outside of the mouth. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone. Um... I think uh, we're gonna uh, take Sophie. I have one question. I'm sorry, could I okay. ask one last question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll make please. it quick. Sorry, Sophie. Um, so it seems like you, I, I feel like you like uh, figured out something really important about the anchovies mm -hmm. yeah. and about what the, uh, what the 
model or that like the standard should be for Mm -hmm. measurement. And so, okay, they've been using muscle. So it's probably like good to keep doing that. But yeah, like, do you think like, will the regulator, if you presented that to the regulators, do you, how hard it is to get them to adapt, adopt another standard? Yeah, I don't, that's a really good question. And I like, don't, I don't really do, I, I don't have a huge understanding of like what it would take to change like the regular monitoring efforts. Mm -hmm. I think that if like the, uh, I think generally people recognize that like they need to be met. Like if you, you can read papers that date back like 10 years where they're talking about how there's this, uh, Miss spatial mismatch between DA events that are being detected on the coastline versus offshore. And no one has really thought to, or I'm, I'm sure they have thought, but no one has really pushed for anchovies to be used as part of those regular monitoring regimes. Mm-hmm. So it's like, in theory, it's not that hard to get routine anchovy sampling because you always have people out in Monterey Bay fishing mm-hmm. that you could just get samples from. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's more about like what it would look like in practice and who we'd be relying on. And mm-hmm. I mean, I know what labs would be analyzing them. Um, But I think at this point, it's just like pushing people to measure something from DA or sorry, measuring DA from anchovies. But there's also Mm -hmm. so much other, so many other platforms that are being used to study DA in offshore regions. So there's like Mm -hmm. underwater gliders that are being sent out when a bloom is already being detected. Um, It's like unlikely that that would ever have enough funding to be out like 24 seven. But that's a good question. Like the goal is to convince the policymakers that we should um, incorporate anchovies, definitely. I see. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. I think I just want to add that one of our collaborators, which is Clarice Anderson, she's the director at SCUS um, in San Diego. And I think it's, um, she's a co-author in the paper too. And she connects with a lot of uh, agencies and universities. So there's a lot of discussions going on and they are trying to improve consist- uh, continuously their protocols. So that's something that I'm sure she's gonna, we're gonna bring to her and we're gonna be discussing with her. So, okay.